What do we see when we turn on the television or grab a newspaper or listen to the radio on our way to work or better yet, scroll through our news feeds? Well, we see everything, but there are 38 ongoing major conflicts in the world today. War, bloodshed, refugees fleeing home. Four of those major conflicts have at least 10,000 deaths per year. But this isn't new. We have been fighting each other since the day mankind discovered fire. We've been fighting over resources, we've been fighting over land, over love, you name it. But history also tells us that there is hope. There is hope that the conflicts that we see before us today, that the crisis, the turmoil that have ripped nations apart across the world, there is hope in our lifetime that not only will those crises, will those wars be resolved, but that there is potential for those conflicts to transition into developed economies and societies. So let me share a personal story. And I'll begin by posing a few questions. Why is it that some societies develop very quickly after war and conflict and other societies spiral further into conflict and chaos. For example, Germany and Japan, immediately after World War II, it only took five years for them to recover economically and to begin to build institutions and a political structure and have jobs and the buildings and schools and society, so much so that history has framed the 1950s in Central Europe that was completely destroyed during World War II, and it was only five years after World War II, has coined it as the golden era of capitalism where it was the economic hub of the Western world. And the same in Japan, when the war ended, it only took about seven years for them to recover economically and to begin to rebuild. But why has that not been the case in other places? In Vietnam post-war, in Eastern Europe, so, back in 2011, something very strange happened. For hundreds and millions and thousands of young people like myself who have roots from the Arab world, saw for the very first time people across the region going to the streets and claiming that they finally wanted democracy, freedom, human rights, justice. Something that we've only ever dreamed of before. So, growing up in the suburbs of South Dublin, I packed a small bag and I told my mom, I'm moving to the Middle East and I want to contribute to the political and social reforms that are ongoing. And like any loving and caring mother who is supportive of her children's dreams and aspirations, my mother said, no. In hindsight, I can see why, but also, like any seasoned teenager at the age of 18, not only did I go, but I also convinced her to come along with me. So I traveled. So I traveled to the Middle East and I visited cities like Tunis and Cairo and cities across Libya and beyond. And I met hundreds, if not thousands, of young people who were so passionate, so driven, full of energy to turn a new leaf, to reverse the decades of corruption in politics and economics, the decades of corruption that has led society to decay at the back end of centuries of colonialism. And we wanted to address the very issue that I brought up. How do we move forward in post-conflict? How do we move forward after war and build institutions and build schools, and build a functioning society that can have impact on the world. How do we do that? How do we do that when we're just young people, when we're farmers and taxi men and grocery store owners and teachers and students? How do we do that at a grassroots level so that society can, in fact, build, sustain, and foster leadership from within? 
So here's what we did. We went on a journey. We went on a journey to discover how to do that. And what we learned was that if you study history, and if you look at all the societies that developed very quickly after conflict, here's what you'll find. There are only three factors. Of course, there's a lot more that comes to post-conflict development after war. But at a grassroots level, we found that at the very heart and core at any post-conflict development after war, a development, a society that needs to develop after war, at the very heart of that, there needs to be knowledge, the democratization of knowledge, the access to information, whether you're a student, or whether you're uneducated, or whether you can read, or whether you can not, or whether you're a professor, or a farmer, or a taxi man. Accessibility to knowledge, to information, to be able to grasp the major issues of the day, and to understand how to filter out the noise from the facts, how to understand the world around you, was at the very, very core of being able to, to build a developed society. Let me give you a very quick example of when knowledge was purposefully and tactfully neglected from, a develop from development. In the late 1950s in China, the Chinese leader Mao had a very simple political agenda. That is to purposefully remove the idea that knowledge and science and information was essential to develop. Now his time in leadership only lasted about 10 or 15 years. And in the last four years of his leadership, a complete and utter rejection of knowledge, science, information, meant that 45 million people died unnecessary deaths because of famine and hunger. 45 million people. Because when we reject hundreds and thousands of years of how to farm the land, not to plant two seeds at the same place, when we reject hundreds of years of education, of knowledge, of grasping the major issues of the day, of facts, 45 million people died in four years. On the other hand, when Singapore ceded from Malaysia and became an independent state, the overwhelming resources of the nation were devoted to knowledge, to education systems, to institutions that inspire people to read, to learn, to seek information. And so Singapore became one of the leading economies in that region. But knowledge alone is not enough. We figured you could have all the knowledge in the world. You can be informed in all elements and aspects of life. But if you are unable to match that knowledge with the skill set necessary to communicate the knowledge, to transform those ideas, the messaging, the knowledge, the information into action, the skill set necessary to bring to life the importance of science. If we are not skilled in matters that involve our own personal leadership, the ability to lead a team, the ability to lead different groups in society behind an idea, behind a vision, then what good is all the knowledge in the world? And so we formed programs across the region to help foster leadership skills at a personal level, at a community level, to help give people the tools to take on their ideas in farming, or their ideas in commercial uh, retail, or their ideas in the various fields and industries of education to life. But that alone was not enough. You can still have all the knowledge and all the weekend courses and skills you ever can, but we found that if you don't go out to society and practice and gain experience, and challenge the world around you with ideas, 
by being innovative, by being proactive, by finding problems in society and matching that with solutions, by going beyond contributing to our individual fields and instead shaping, defining, and leading the very forefront of whatever it is we study or do. Only then can society at a very grassroot level rise from a cycle of conflict and war and begin to rebuild itself and foster leadership from within and create a culture of service that will help the society and the economy grow. And this is not to say that every one of us here today, or anyone watching online, this is not to say that we must wait until conflict or war hits our homes or our lives for us to be able to take action on the major issues of the day. Every single one of us, every institution that cares about fostering leadership, every home that cares about fostering leadership, every community and society that wants to solve the major issues of the day, from climate change to global warming to denuclearization to the refugee problems at our seashores, we need to equip ourselves with the knowledge, with the skills, and take the initiative and to be proactive and to go and to leave our comfort zones and challenge the world around us with new and fresh ideas. Thank you.